Hello and welcome to the fourth uh, Small Utilities Approach to Transportation Electrification webinar. My name is Symbia Yusuf. I am the Communications Associate with Fourth, and I will be moderating this webinar. Uh, attendees, please submit questions through the attendee chat. Uh, we will get all the questions answered through uh, the presentation and at the end we will have a Q&A. The attendee chat is on the upper right hand corner, right next, uh, right there. If you have any questions, please submit them throughout the webinar and we will make sure to have a Q&A time after the presenters are done. Today, we will be joined by Ford's Program Manager, Kelly Yurek, and our guest speakers, Juan Sepper Muenas, a Business Line Manager at Eugene Water and Electric Board. We will also be joined by Stu Green, Climate and Energy Analyst at City of Ashland. Juan focuses on electrification and energy efficiency. His background is in energy management and efficiency in the utility sector, sector for over 10 years. His approach to transportation and electrification is to create products and services that are strategically accessible to, and consider local and regional emissions, environmental peak and financial impact. Kelly promotes electric vehicle adoption through utility engagement and supports consumer engagement at the Go Forth Electric Showcase. She holds a Master of Environmental Management from Portland State University and brings a passion for sustainability to the Ford team. Stu Green is the Climate and Energy Analyst at City of Ashland. Stu is responsible for the overall implementation of Ashland's Climate and Energy Action Plan which seeks to dramatically reduce Ashland's climate altering emissions and prepare the community for a changing climate. Without further ado, I am gonna pass it along to Kelly. Thank you, Symbiot. So as she said, my name is Kelly Yurick and I am a program manager here at Forth. I handle our most, most of our utility engagement work so I'll just start off by briefly giving you some information about Forth. So we are a nonprofit trade association that's based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we serve the Pacific Northwest um, most closely, but we are rapidly expanding our work to include all of the, the United States as well as some work uh, abroad. So our mission is to promote electric, smart, and shared transportation. We have members from utilities, OEMs, municipalities, nonprofits, local governments, and others. And we work with these organizations to help move the needle on EV adoption. We're active in four main areas. The first is industry growth and development, which is really um, at the core of what we were created for and as, originally as a state-funded organization. Um, so we host monthly networking events, webinars such as this, and also uh, host the largest conference on EVs in the country, that is Roadmap, uh, which is coming up in June of this year. I've got a slide about that in a couple minutes. Um, secondly, uh, we do policy advocacy. So again, mostly located here in Oregon and Washington, um, but we helped get the HB 2017 bill passed, which has allowed for the EV rebate in Oregon, uh, which is really exciting. But um, it's just a number of the things that we advocate for, um, both at the state and uh, federal level. And then, of course, direct consumer engagement. The majority of our consumer engagement work focuses on electric vehicles. And one of our major projects is the Electric Showcase in downtown Portland, where people can learn about EVs, charging, financial incentives, and test drives cars for free. We're brand neutral and don't sell anything. Our hope is just to provide information about EVs to consumers so that they are well prepared to make a purchase when the time comes. And then finally, we also do demonstration and pilot projects to help bring these technologies to communities where they may not have otherwise been introduced. So we do um, projects with 
electric vehicles as well as electric bicycles. And we're starting to work more and more with TNC drivers through Uber and Lyft um, to help electrify those aspects of mobility. All right, so I'd also like to announce for any of you that may have missed it that we recently published a white paper in January, which presents an overview of the EV market, makes the case for utility involvement in transportation electrification, and outlines a number of strategies and actions utilities can take to position themselves as an expert on EVs to their customers. Uh, the link is right here, and you can also find that on our website. Uh, so I've included one table from the white paper here, which outlines a spectrum of activities utilities may choose. For each of these, we offer examples of utilities taking these and other actions across the country. The first step for any utility, of course, is to learn about EVs for themselves and begin promoting these technologies in-house. Second is to begin planning for the impacts of EVs expected in the future. Once they are at this stage, utilities can start engaging their customers through outreach and engagement opportunities. And finally, utilities can promote these technologies by offering incentives and programs to encourage EV adoption among their customers. I hope you'll take a chance to read the white paper if you haven't already, and we'll be also including a link to it in the follow-up email from this webinar. So then just a little bit a brief overview of our utility engagement work. Um, so most notably, we are designated as the backstop aggregator for the Oregon Clean Fuels Program to assist utilities across the state utilize monetized credits generated from residential electric vehicle charging. Specifically, we are aggregating credits for the utilities that have not opted in to the Clean Fuels Program, but our efforts are being applied statewide. In support of our mission to advance electric vehicle adoption, We'd like to help utilities become an invaluable resource to their customers about the cost saving benefits of electric cars. A number of the services we offer include coordinating ride and drive events where people can get behind the wheel of an electric car, consulting on charging station installations, hosting quarterly webinars, transportation electrification plan consulting, dealer outreach and demonstration projects. But we'd like to see that list grow to meet the need. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, with the hint of spring on our doorsteps, we're getting closer to our roadmap conference, which takes place in Portland in June every year. It brings together industry professionals from across the country and world and is truly a fantastic conference. Program and registration are live on our website now. And we're also hosting two utility focused events in conjunction with the conference this year. One is about EV basics, and the second will be a more in-depth look at demand response and smart charging. You can find more information about these workshops on the Roadmap website as well, which is listed there at the bottom. And with that, that is all I've got to say from the fourth side, and I'm going to introduce our first guest speaker, uh, which is Juan Serpomunos from Eugene Water and Electric Board. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Juan Serpa Munoz. I work as a business line manager at Eugene Water and Electric Board. EWEP is a customer owned utility, and we have about 90,000 meters, 80,000 of them being residential. And our power portfolio is about 90% carbon neutral. My presentation is going to talk about what we're doing and also some considerations as, as to something that we call smart electrification and how electric vehicles fit in this area for us. Looking at EV trends on this slide, we can see just the exponential forecast for adoption on electric vehicles. And taking a look at uh, a more local view, in eWeb territory, we had 321 electric vehicles in 2016. The number jumped to 403 in 2017. And as of the first six months of 2018, we had 744. We don't have all the numbers for 2018 yet, but you can see that growth that is taking place for us. And then on the bottom table, it's our clean ride rebate. And that's one of the programs that we have for electric vehicles. And in 2016, we had six participants, 2017, 14. 2018, we jumped to 77, which was a good jump. But then we can see that in just January and February, we already had 35 participants. So that growth is definitely taking place in our neighborhood as well. 
Uh, this is all supported by uh, commitments from industry as well, kind of like General Motors, what they're doing and providing all these electric vehicles. So the adoption of electric vehicles is definitely taking place. And we have to try to assess what it is that we want to do and what role we want to play in this. So why electric vehicles? Uh, this is stuff that I think most here on the presentation are already aware of here for Oregon. 39% of greenhouse gases in Oregon come from the transportation sector. So having an electric vehicle strategy makes perfect sense reducing emissions. There's also health benefits to this from the reduction of exhaust emissions. And this addresses the equity piece because a lot of vulnerable communities tend to be around freeways, highways. So this is one additional component to help our overall customer sectors. And then cost savings, reducing fueling costs and less maintenance. And this for us is also a, a need to make sure that we stay competitive with our pricing to continue to provide a value to our customers as they transfer from combustion vehicles to electric vehicles. And the third, fourth bullet, excuse me, flexibility of charging. That's a component of what we consider smart electrification. So being able to shift that load when there's available clean power makes a lot of sense for us. And again, that's one of the strong components for electric vehicles for any utilities. And so we can see that there's a social, environmental, economic benefit to the entire community by us helping in the adoption of electric vehicles. Our programs include incentives, loans, and education. We have a $300 clean ride rebate, and that's an incentive that goes for anybody who purchased an electric vehicle. And that can be a used or new electric vehicle. And it can help with pay for a new charger or pay for fuel for a year. We also have commercial loans for charging stations. And on the education side, we have partnered with the University of Oregon and the city of Eugene to provide something called RevUp Eugene. And these are workshops where customers can go and learn about electric vehicles, get a 101. And there's also some agreements with some dealerships to provide additional incentives and discounts on the purchase of electric vehicles. For eWeb customers who participate on these workshops, we also provide an additional rebate when purchasing an electric vehicle. These workshops are open to the entire community, so you don't have to be an eWeb customer to attend, but we provide specific incentives and additional rebates to those customers who are our, ours. But the dealership uh, discounts, those go to anybody who buys those vehicles. We also have ride and drive events, and we participate in the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. And lastly, partnerships. Uh, this is really complex complex work. It's great to be able to reach out to other utilities, cities, and be part of different work groups such as this one. So internal and external partnerships, I think, are key. And that's one thing that we've been trying to focus and trying to make sure that we have a solid uh, foundation for uh, work groups throughout the area, again, and also internally. As we look to our new programs, in trying to uh, take advantage of the flexibility of charging for electric vehicles. We are adding a residential level two charger loan program and also rebate for public and workplace charging. We are looking at what an EV rate would be for fleets and also a dealership incentive program where we incentivize the sales of electric vehicles per sales representative based on the number of vehicles that they sell. And this is just to help with the adoption a lot of times in trying to buy an electric vehicle, the sales representative may not be highly motivated to sell that vehicle or may not have enough knowledge. So we're looking at ways and providing a complete solution where we provide tools, education, and this is on an ongoing basis. So as we our rebates change or increase or we have more programs and we can keep up with the dealerships and let them know what the changes are and continue to provide that incentive on the sales. Because we're trying to make our programs not only available, but also accessible, we're looking at how to access the limited income sector. A rebate or an incentive uh, is just not enough in these cases. And so we're looking at working with companies like Envoy to provide a car sharing pilot project where we can bring electric vehicles to a limited income multifamily project and then have them have access to those vehicles. Uh, so we're looking at what the strategy would be and working right now with a limited income agency, St. Vincent de Paul, to see what this will look like. So we're very excited about our programs. Um, 
that that we're having and and these like the the pilot program for limited income. The next section of my presentation is on the city council asks what would happen if we had 25,000 50,000 or 75,000 electric vehicles by 2030. So we did some calculations and these are rough calculations but we work with power planning and systems engineering to see the impact on power planning the purchasing of electricity, but also on our service territory. What does that mean? And the results were on the energy side, we can procure that energy. It would be about 10% increase if we look at 75,000 75, electric vehicles. So that would not be so challenging as something that we can handle. The challenge would come on the peak side. And this is worst case, unmanaged peak, everybody charging from six to eight. Uh, so that would definitely change, but this is just a visual and again, rough numbers to just present the idea that if we don't manage that level of charging taking place, it can really create a challenge, not only on the emissions, because all we're, although we're 90% carbon neutral, 10 years from now with things changing, nobody really knows what can happen. We would be tapping perhaps into much dirtier fuel sources and also the impact on our distribution as well we would have to manage where this is taking place to make sure that we have capacity to provide that service to our customers. So peak is really the, the challenge in this. Uh, taking a strategy where we are able to manage that peak through price signals. And I also think value signals because um, the customer who buys an electric vehicle, there's something else that is driving that individual. In a lot of cases, the consideration for emissions is definitely plays an important role. And so even if a value signal is sent, so even if you're informed the customer saying, hey, if you charge at this time, then the impact on the emission side is gonna be less. I think that can be a strong enough signal if a clear price signal is not present yet. So again, the electric vehicles present a benefit for us because it's part of our smart electrification program where we can flex that energy. There's coincidental peak but we have the ability through technology to be able to move that and shift that. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time. And I understand that we're saving questions for the end. So thanks. Great, thank you, Juan. And now I will turn us over to Stu Green from City of Ashland to continue uh, the webinar with his presentation. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'll take that as yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So Stu Green here, I'm the Climate and Energy Analyst in Ashland, Oregon. And uh, we have embarked on uh, some pretty small uh, transportation electrification programs here. Uh, and, and I think that there are a variety of reasons that we find that this makes sense for us. Uh, something that I've been talking about and hearing from others about more and more really are the air quality impacts. Uh, I think with transportation, we have a very unique opportunity to address uh, a whole host of pollutants. Uh, and certainly in Southern Oregon here, folks are acutely aware of smoke impacts now, uh, more so than in the past. Um, but I think there's a general awareness of air quality and the fact that cleaning up transportation emissions is a very viable way to address that. Uh, additionally, we are uh, looking at electrification of transportation for greenhouse gas reductions, uh, as well as making our utility uh, stable over the long run. Um, we are trying to explore uh, some ideas of, of future storage, and uh, I'm very excited about the idea of vehicle to grid technology when that comes of age. Uh, and to see how that can really impact us uh, with resiliency. Uh, now, we haven't been able to explore that much yet, uh, but I think it's a strong reason why we would like to do that. Uh, and then lastly, uh, EVs are very popular in Ashland. Um, I, I'll back up one slide, actually. Uh, so this is uh, Corey Ann Wynn's data from uh, DEQ and uh, showing registrations across counties. And I, I put Ashland in there at the front uh, of course, it's not a totally fair comparison to look city to county, uh, but our, our Jackson County is represented there right in the middle uh, as well. And so looking at the per capita uptake 
Uh, there's clearly something going on in Ashland. Uh, I'm very interested to compare these numbers to other cities, uh, but I think it's notable that the Jackson County number is pretty average uh, with the other rural counties, uh, whereas inside the city limits of Ashland, we have a very significant uptake here. So uh, Ashland, uh, for folks who aren't familiar, is a very small community. Uh, we're only about 22,000 people, a uh, very tourist-centric economy, uh, only about six square miles, uh, and we are a full requirements uh, municipal utility uh, with BPA. Uh, so we source all of our imported power from BPA, uh, and Avista is our gas utility. Uh, and you can see there we have a pretty small electric department uh, all posing by the bucket truck there. So we have a variety of programs in place here. Uh, we are a very small utility, a uh, very small city, uh, so we don't have a lot of resources to push around, uh, but we have created some community grants which have been fairly successful. Uh, we are also offering an incentive, uh, which has been popular, although it is very small. Uh, it's very similar to what, what Juan described with the eWeb incentive. Uh, we also have some public charging that's been in place uh, since initially 2011 when the first uh, electric highway infrastructure was installed, uh, but since then we have re upgraded it a bit. Uh, and then we've also got some new internal policies uh, that are coming up here. Uh, so I'll just speak briefly to the community grant. Um, this is something that we have been able to leverage an existing program inside City of Ashland which is that we had an economic development, tourism, and sustainability grant program. Uh, I've been successful in sort of seeding uh, ideas to, to community organizations to then apply for these grants. Uh, one of those uh, that we talked several years ago about wouldn't it be great if we could get a small group of people and, and directly lobby businesses to adopt EV. Uh, so we were able to get a grant application together uh, this group, Electric Vehicles Ashland, uh, formed, uh, and so they offer now between $1,000 and $1,500 cash incentives to businesses uh, who are willing to get an EV. Uh, so this is does come from the city fund, but it's run by the community, which I really appreciate because they're able to do the outreach that feels right to them. Uh, and it's pretty small. We're looking at 8 to 10 awards for this first cycle, uh, and hopefully that program will uh, continue uh, into the future. So in addition, we've been able to put together with utility funds and economic development funds uh, what we're calling the Empower EV pilot program. Uh, this actually began in September and will be concluding here at the end of March. Uh, but folks can essentially choose one of three options. They can get $200 incentive on a plug-in hybrid electric uh, as long as it has a 16 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, they can get a $300 incentive on a battery electric vehicle, uh, same requirement. Uh, or if it's a commercial electric account, uh, they're able to apply for a $500 workplace charger incentive, uh, which those, in, we're hoping to, to fully subscribe this. I've been very happy with the uptake of the vehicles. It's been more difficult than I expected to get workplaces to adopt chargers. Uh, and especially in Ashland, where we have a very tourist-centric economy, I think there's an incredible opportunity for our local businesses to, to be leaders and also uh, a huge uh, sort of potential for diffusion of information here. Uh, I mentioned that we only have 22,000 people, but there's upwards of a quarter million to 300,000 people who pass through Ashland every year uh, on their way to the Shakespeare Festival or another local attraction. Uh, but for this incentive program, uh, the EVs can be newer used, uh, and we have approximately, you know, enough funds for about 30 vehicles and around 10 uh, vehicle chargers. This is another program that I'm hoping, uh, as we enter our next budget cycle, we'll be able to uh, continue down the road. Additionally, we've been able to do a little bit of work on our public charging. Um, because we are a very small operation here, I've been focusing on trying to keep the costs down as much as possible. Um, because of that, uh, we ended up, when, when our blink chargers died, uh, 
you can see in this picture on the left, there's two concrete pads, uh, one immediately behind the, the blue Tesla and another on the right. Uh, those used to be the home to two Blink Level 2 chargers, uh, which ceased operating several years ago. Uh, so this parking area actually reverted back to uh, combustion engine parking uh, and was depainted uh, and forgotten about. Um, but around last year, we were able to uh, freshen up the paint and installed uh, six new Level 2 chargers. Uh, part of our requirement was that we wanted to be able to charge a fee, uh, but we didn't necessarily want to charge a fee. Uh, so we worked with eMotorWorks to develop a payment platform that folks could use over their phone, uh, which was uh, successful and interesting, uh, but we ultimately decided that we're going to keep the charging at no fee for the time being. Uh, we're able to backfill those funds with clean fuel credits that we do collect from the public charging. Uh, and because our wholesale cost of power is so low, uh, we almost... Uh, more than break even by giving away this power to our residents. Uh, so, and then one other thing that I think is is very important for City of Ashland and for the utility of Ashland, uh, but it does not look very good, um, is is this internal policy we created, which is aptly called the future use of GHG emitting fuels in municipal equipment stock. Uh, so th the gist of this is that any vehicle that the city purchases or the utility purchases uh, needs to be evaluated uh, for the potential to use non-fossil energy sources. Uh, so the, the direct result of this is that we're expecting all new passenger vehicles will be electric, uh, and unless there's a need like a fire truck or some heavy-duty vehicle or a specialized piece of equipment that simply isn't available in a non-fossil variety or is not practically uh, attainable. Uh, so we're giving people an out with the city. We recognize that they need to have the right equipment, but we also want to encourage folks to get electric or non-fossil fuel uh, vehicles as much as possible. A few things that we've identified here in Ashland uh, that, that are important next steps for us, I think, are that we would like to have uh, DC fast charging. Uh, it's maybe beyond the scope of our utility to install and maintain uh, that charging infrastructure uh, given our current programs and resources, uh, but we recognize that that's an important piece. Uh, we're maybe just a little far off I-5 uh, to, make it, to make it an automatic in with the electric highway, uh, but nonetheless, with our adoption rates and our tourism here, uh, we think it's an important addition. Uh, I'm also looking as part of our work with the Climate Action Plan on home electrification as much as possible. Uh, and the reason this is relevant for transportation is that we see in a lot of cases uh, the need for increased service panels, uh, especially on new construction, uh, to accommodate all the new electrical loads that we are hoping people will install. Um, we have a lot of old architecture here in Ashland, and generally service panels are not uh, generous in their their free capacity. Uh, another thing that's pretty important and, and super interesting to us, I think, is that we are getting ready to sort of do a utility planning exercise to, to determine what is our future. Uh, we're a municipal electric utility, part of the city, uh, and so that gives us some pretty unique opportunities. Uh, it also creates some unique challenges, but we're really hoping to work with the citizens here and with our partners at BPA to try to figure out what the future of the utility is going to be and how do we want to evolve. Do we want to become uh, generators? Do we want to uh, provide energy storage services for utility customers? Do we want to provide car chargers? So a lot of interesting questions, I think, for both load, load development and load management. Uh, and then the last thing that I've identified as a, as a pretty important need, uh, I think, speaks to a lot of these other things is uh, support in the building code and at the land use level uh, to maximize electric transportation. Uh, there's definitely a lot of wrinkles that could still be smoothed out, especially with regard to new construction uh, as to what's the best way to tackle that. Uh, and so I, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I gather that uh, Symbiot and Kelly will take it for questions. Yes.
feel free to submit any questions you have through the attendee chat. Uh, we will open it up now for Q&A. In the meantime, we have a question from Tim Treadwell to Juan. How is eWeb tracking registrations? Where is the data coming from? And is this an outsourced level? Yeah, so I'm assuming you mean the not our program participation, but the DMV registration. So we are part of the Clean Fuels program, and DEQ provides us that information. And they will have the numbers, I believe they said in Q2 for the total of 2018. So again, yeah, it's uh, DMV registration through DEQ. Thank you, Juan. Uh, another question for Juan, and we can open this up to Stu as well from Neil. To um, what are some examples, good and bad, in your initial auto dealer outreach? So I, I don't know if we have examples yet. Uh, we're still trying to finalize some details on on that, but um, it's been difficult sometimes to get uh, dealerships to want to participate, and so it takes. Uh, a lot of communication and, and learning what it is that they need so to make sure that we're providing a tool that is beneficial for them. Uh, we're working with entities like Plugstar and they have a, a quite a comprehensive model for this approach. So um, leveraging their, um, their knowledge on this effort uh, has definitely been helpful. Uh, another piece that could be a challenge is trying to get the sales representatives to come to the orientations. We want to provide an ongoing or orientations maybe once a quarter where we can talk about the program. The Because so many sales representatives come in and go in that industry, that's also challenging and trying to make sure that they all understand what is happening. And so Plugstar has a, a pretty neat tool that is kind of like an app platform where uh, they provide ongoing education for the sales representative. So if I'm selling a vehicle and maybe I went to the class and so I really understand how to sell this vehicle, I understand the EV buyer, but maybe I'm sick today or for this week and I can't come to go to work and the other individuals there are not as trained or they don't feel comfortable with electric vehicles. Um, there's this app or educational tool where somebody can just pick it up and understand what the e-web rebates, for example, are what the vehicle in the show room can do, uh, different statistics on that. So they can have an intelligent conversation with the customer. And so the challenge, I guess, is making sure that we are able to educate the sales representative or provide these orientations, but keeping that knowledge with them. And I guess the, the, the counter to that challenge will be if we can get access to a tool, something like that, that Plugstar has, that we can provide the sales representative. So even if somebody who went through the training is not there, and there's still access to the information to provide a better experience to the EV buyer. Uh, Stu, would you like to respond to that question as well? Sure. Yeah, it's you know it's been interesting for City of Ashland to do that kind of outreach to dealers, uh, in part because we have no dealers within city limits, so it's a little bit of a different relationship to get them uh, sort of tuned into our local incentives. Uh, and the other issue I've encountered is that the sales staff typically rotate out from those jobs pretty quickly. Uh, so if I can't connect with somebody higher up in the dealership, uh, it's incredibly difficult to to have any sort of, uh, you know, to make the message stick with them, I guess. And, and even then it re requires having some attention from that manager uh, that they sort of believe in the benefits of EV and are not completely resistant to it. Uh, and, you know, typically I've found uh, there are, dealerships that are very keen on it, and there are those that have little interest. And I think that those will distinguish themselves in sales uh, as time goes on. Thank you. Um, we got a suggestion from Jennifer to eWeb and the city of Ashland re in regards to dealership to check out the Chargeway app, which is um, help, it's a local Oregon-based company and a free app that helps dealerships connect with buyers when it comes to um, information on EVs and EV charging. 
We do have another question from Ken. Uh, do you have an approved product list of EV chargers that receive utility incentives? If so, what criteria are you using? Have you settled on one platform or willing to work with several EV management platforms? Uh, this is Stu. I can take a crack at that. Uh, you know, we we do not want to have a limited list of chargers that that qualify for the incentive necessarily, not not by brand, uh, but we do have a, a spec in the incentive that asks for 240 volt, uh, 30 amp minimum level two charging. Uh, so that's the that's the minimum standard that we support for installing a workplace charger with our incentive money. Um, and that that's, seems like it's been fine so far. And this is uh, one for me, Web. Uh, for us, yeah, we also don't want to necessarily say that you need to buy a specific brand. Uh, but so our level two charger for residential, we're still finalizing that. So it's not out yet, but uh, we would want that to be level two and so 240. Um, and also on the amperage, uh, on the residential side, we're not sure if we're going to go 32 or 16. Um, if we go 32 amps, it's it's nice for the future, but uh, we also want to be aware of those customers who may not be there to buy that, maybe not be in that place to be able to buy that. So we're not sure which to do. On the commercial side, definitely the, the 32 amp makes sense for us. And again, no requirement on specific brand, but simply a level two. Okay, thank you, Stu and Juan. Um, if there are no more questions, we can open it up for one more minute if um, there are any lasting questions. Um, we have a question from Martin. Uh, what measures are you looking at for smoothing peak demands? Um, Stu or Juan? Yeah, I can, I can start. Uh, so we don't have any peak issues yet. Um, and so we're looking at providing, for example, these level, making the level two chargers more accessible to customers so that if somebody needs to charge, then it's easy to easier for a customer. If you're on level two, you may have to charge for a longer period of time and you may need to charge from five or 6 p.m. whenever you get home to a later time. But if you have level two, then Two, two hours of charging or three hours at most, I would think for the amount of driving that takes place in our area would be more than sufficient. So whether you charge at midnight or you charge at 9 p.m. or at four in the morning, you should be okay. So some of the measures that we're taking is kind of promoting that level two charging. We do understand that it's a higher demand, that the wattage is higher, but because you're able to do it that much quicker then I think long-term will provide more flexibility on that, we're also looking at potential EV rates and just education um, on the benefits of charging at a later time. And again, because the EV buyer is purchasing that vehicle, at least at this time, for several reasons, which one of them includes emissions and in the, the, the environmental impact with the education piece, I think that we'd be highly inclined to to make the change and because the programming at the the vehicle is so simple you just program it and then you don't have to worry about it you can just plug it in at five or whenever you get home and it will still charge when you are going to charge there's a really neat solution um and i forget the name but i've been talking to uh i think it was uh uc berkeley uh but there's a platform and the one of the, char the the juice box are implementing that, but it's only available in California, where it's through some algorithm, it can actually capture when it is the best time to charge uh, based on how clean the, the dispatchable sources are. So that's another um, area that we're looking at because uh, as a customer, you just plug in and you don't worry about it. The algorithm will figure out when the clean fuel is and then it would charge your vehicle at that time. That would also address peak indirectly uh, because um, it tends those tend to coincide when the highest cost and also when the cleanest fuel, at least in, for us, is, is um, happening. So measures, um, we're looking at what we're going to do but we don't have any uh, like measures that we're actually taking directly, like uh, uh, incentives on on 
on not charging on peak, but more facilitating these level two chargers and beginning the education piece as we as we see these electric vehicles increase in adoption in our service territory. Stu, would you like to answer the measures oh, question? Yeah. For future demand, uh, you know, we're not really addressing that at this point in time. Uh, as far as any chargers that the city is purchasing, I'm trying to buy the most intelligent chargers I can for the limited resources we have. Uh, and so far that's been good, but a lot of the uh, sort of smart charging features like Juan described are not yet available in this area. Uh, so we have a pretty awesome SCADA system at our utility and I think are prepared to do a lot of monitoring. Uh, we haven't had to adjust for demand uh, yet. Uh, so we'll see when that's going to happen. And, and I think that that'll be part of our utility planning exercise just to do some calculations like eWeb did showing potential impacts from peak charging events uh, and see what we can do to mitigate those. Thank you. One question. Is eWeb using the household level information from the DMV and DEQ to engage customers about optimal charging behaviors? Yeah, the, the information that we get from um, DMV, DEQ, it's not necessarily zip codes or anything like that where we can know who these customers are. It's literally just numbers on the amount of vehicles that are in our service territory. So we use that information um, in a way that, okay, we're seeing what the adoption is, how many vehicles we have, but we can't necessarily target anybody uh, because that level of detail is not provided. Uh, what we do intend to use is our clean ride rebate participation uh, and then be able to reach out to customers that way and also just general education that we can do through other efforts like the Rev Up Eugene workshops. So uh, again, the DMVDQ data provides uh, a look at what is happening, but it doesn't really allow us to do any detailed outreach with that information. Thank you, Juan. Um, one last question. Are there any data requirements or equipment requirements to allow yourself to be set up for future demand response solutions to potential peak demands? Steward one. I'm, I'm sure there are some equipment requirements uh, for future demand response, but I wouldn't be able to say what those are. Um, I'm thinking of it mostly in the sense of uh, public and home charging is, you know, can we use the chargers to help mitigate peak demand events? Uh, but I'm not at a place in the utility where I can say, you know, from at the substation level, what kind of equipment we might want to look at. Um, I'm certain that there is some requirement. Um, we are hoping to look, you know, utility-wide at a sort of a broader energy storage uh, options and see what, what could we do as a small utility to have, you know, maybe neighborhood level storage or citywide storage or home level storage. Um, but we're in the very early phase of that uh, investigation. <clears throat> yeah, and I would say on the demand response side, yeah, we're definitely not there yet. So um, there's some charging units that claim to provide that capability. So we will look to those, but we're not there yet. So. I wouldn't be able to provide a good answer on those data requirements or equipment requirements. We want something that would be capable of handling that. Uh, and internally, we also need to have the ability on our own platforms to be able to handle that. And that is not necessarily the case at this time. Thank you. And I think that's all the questions um, we have. Um, on this screen, you do have our speakers' email addresses and uh, Kelly's. So if you have any further questions, you can please um, send those directly to Juan, Stu, or Kelly. And um, we will also be sending out the slides um, and the presentation after the webinar um, so you can have the chance to go over it at your own pace. Um, I think Kelly has a few more words uh, for us, then we'll wrap it up. Yes, so we'll also be sure to send around, um, in addition to the slides, a link to um, our white paper that just came out that I mentioned, as well as a link to registering for our roadmap conference coming up in June. 
And then finally, I just want to give a brief plug for our next utility working group webinar, which is going to be happening on March 26th. So just two weeks from today, actually. And we will be hosting Tan uh, Cam Lehulier from Tacoma Power um, to talk about some strategies for financing uh, electric vehicle and promotion, so transportation electrification um, within the utility. And we're still working on securing our second speaker for that. But once we do, we'll definitely update our invite to that webinar with those details. And so we'll send the invite along at the closure of this webinar for to register for that webinar as well. Thank you, Kelly, Juan, and Stu for presenting um, to us today about our your efforts to promote electric vehicles among your customers. Um, our next fourth uh, webinar will be April 9th, and we will be discussing um, electrifying shared mobility with Lauren Schweitzer from Lyft, and our program manager, Tegan Malloy, will also be joining us at that webinar. Again, it is April 9th. Thank you so much for joining us today at our webinar on the small utilities approach to transportation electrification. Um, again, we will be sending the slides and if you have any questions, we will also be sending out the recording as well, a link to the recording. So you will have the recording and the webinar slides. Um, if there are no more questions, um, again, thank you so much. And we hope you join us on April 9th and also on April 26th for our utility webinar and for our April webinar as well. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.